are we running out of antibiotics that work? Why can't we just make new ones? Turns out making a new antibiotic is rather tricky. Uh, many people are familiar with the first commercially available antibiotic, something called penicillin, that Alexander Fleming discovered in the late 1920s. Became widely commercially available in the 1940s. Uh, and that ushered in what we call the golden era of antibiotic development, the 1950s, where it seemed like every few months a new antibiotic hit the market. Uh, but then something interesting happened, and that isn't a story that isn't often told, which is what happened after that golden decade of the 1950s. And unfortunately, what happened is that we turned our attention to other conditions, things like heart disease and cancer. And the pharmaceutical industry started making far more lucrative drugs to treat those conditions. And it wasn't until the 1990s that we appreciated the full scope of this problem. And we've been playing catch up ever since, trying to make new antibiotics. The reason it's so hard to make a new one is that the profit margins are very slim. It often takes a billion dollars and 10 years of testing to develop a new antibiotic. And the problem is, when that drug hits the market, it often isn't a big bestseller. So compare an antibiotic to something like a blood pressure medication. That blood pressure medication is something that a guy like me, a doctor, would go to you as the patient and say, take this pill every day for the rest of your life. Now that's a great marketing strategy. Now compare that to an antibiotic where a doctor like me is very stingy about doling it out. I only give it in short courses. And even that wonderful antibiotic is eventually going to encounter drug-resistant bacteria, which would render it useless. So the pharmaceutical companies are now saying, wait a second, why do we want to invest a billion dollars in a drug that may not be prescribed very often? And so that has caused this downturn in research and development of new antibiotics. We have a number of them in the pipeline, but the question is, are they antibiotics to treat the conditions we need? So the short answer to this question is, we have lots of new antibiotics coming, but we don't know if they're for the right conditions. Uh, that's going to be the future of drug development, is saying, how do we figure out what's the next antibiotic we need? And you have to forecast, sometimes a decade in advance, and that's what we spend a lot of time trying to figure out. What's causing the spread of antibiotic-resistant superbugs? Well, there's problems large and small that cause the spread. Uh, on the small scale, it's things like doctors and dentists um, prescribing antibiotics when they shouldn't. Sometimes that's hard. If a patient comes to your office with a fever and asks for an antibiotic and you say no, and then they come back again two days later and ask for an antibiotic and you say no because you think it's a virus and the antibiotic won't work, and then the patient comes back a third time, many doctors may eventually relent and say, okay, fine, here's a z -pack. Um, that inappropriate prescription may cause the bacteria to mutate, where there's a trillion bacteria living in your body at any one time. And when you take an antibiotic, it's going to kill a certain percentage of those bacteria, but some of them are going to survive. And they're going to survive either because they're inherently resistant to the antibiotic, or they develop molecular machinery to evade those antibiotics. And if those spread, it can cause problems all because of an inappropriate antibiotic prescription. So that's on the small scale. And then there's the large scale, which is using antibiotics in commercial agriculture and farming. A classic example is the tulip gardens in the Netherlands and in Colombia, where we pump fungicides into these gardens to protect these beautiful flowers. But if you study the soil beneath the flowers, they are teeming with drug-resistant fungi and bacteria because they've now been exposed to antibiotics and to antifungal drugs and they figure out how to evade these new predators. Why are we having an antibiotic resistant bacteria problem? Haven't we been using antibiotics for the last 50 years with no major problem? The fundamental problem is that all of life evolves and mutates and whenever you come up with a new way to destroy pathogens. Some of those pathogens will die, but many will survive. And those that do survive are now drug resistant. So if we come up with a treatment for influenza, it may wipe out 99% of the influenza viruses circulating in the world. But that 1% that survives is going to be resistant because it is mutated. And so that's called selective pressure. 
Every time we come up with a new antibiotic or a new treatment, we're pressuring the pathogens to mutate and to become more virulent. And this is what keeps infectious disease specialists up at night, is saying, okay, we've got a new drug to treat a condition, but we're going to need another drug soon uh, as these pathogens continue to evolve. And what we're trying to figure out using artificial intelligence is how are they going to evolve so that we can stay one step ahead of them. You say superbugs are everywhere, but does that really matter if they are there in small quantities? And what's the real risk? This is a wonderful question. Uh, the most common question I get after someone reads my book is, so should I be afraid of this thing? The answer is complicated, but the short answer is that if you have a normally functioning immune system, you don't need to worry about superbugs. In fact, in this room, there could be dozens of different drug-resistant pathogens known as superbugs. But there's no fear because I've got multiple ways of protecting myself. The first being my skin. There could be superbugs in the corner of this room. And if they were to fall off of the ceiling and onto my arm, I'm OK because I have the skin protecting me. Uh, if the superbugs were to get under my skin, uh, I've got an immune system that will start attacking it. And if it were to travel from my blood to my heart, I have an additional layer of immune system. And so there is a series of, of protections we have. But the people who run into trouble are those who have some sort of immune impairment or they have a break in one of their protections. So if you have a big cut on your arm and you go swimming in a pool that has a dirty water, that allows a large influx of superbugs to get into your system. You still may have an immune system that wipes it out. But let's say that you're taking chemotherapy. You're somebody with cancer, and you've just taken chemo that wipes out the cancer, but also wipes out your immune system. You're at high risk. I went through this recently with a family member who was on chemo, and I was very careful. I didn't shake his hand. I, gave, I didn't give him hugs because I didn't want to tra transfer anything from myself to him. And so what I tell people is the first step, if you want to educate yourself on your own risk, is to talk to your doctor and say, how's my immune system? Uh, many of the patients I see with superbug infections either don't know that they have a medical condition that weakens their immune system, or they don't know that they're on a medication that can weaken their immune system. Many people take prednisone for arthritis. Well, at high doses, that can really wreak havoc on your immune system and predispose you to drug-resistant pathogens in your environment. So begin with a simple conversation with your doctor. And if your doctor can't answer that question, you might want to find a new doctor.